How are we doing, class? Today we're going to be taking a look at our first of the five major world religions, which is Hinduism. So the objective today, you'll be able to identify several key beliefs and practices of Hinduism. So when you think of Hinduism, what country generally comes to mind? Take a few seconds, kind of think about it. What do you think about when Hinduism is said? What country? What is the meaning of monotheism? Um, that's something that you should be pretty familiar with. Being in the United States, and probably predominantly most of us are Christian or Muslim or Jewish of, or of some sort, so monotheism should be something that you're familiar with. What's the meaning of polytheism? Pretty much the same as mono, but the word at the start, poly, is different. So think about that. What's polytheism mean? And what is the term meant by anthropomorphism? Okay, what does that mean? So we're not going to do this part, okay? on page 66 of your textbook. Don't worry about that. Okay, you should have already read that last week. So taking a look at some temples, okay? This is a Hindu temple right outside of Chicago. Um, you've probably never seen a Hindu temple before, but they're even located in the state of Illinois. Here's one in India, okay? A little more colorful, a little different probably than the churches we're familiar with seeing. Here's one in California, okay? Um, kind of similar to the first one we saw. So the Aryan, Aryans transform in India. Some scholars believe that sometime around 2000 BC, so BC, remember, means 2000 before Christ. So before Jesus was born, that's how our calendar works. A group of people called the Aryans crossed into the Indus River Valley or present day India. Other scholars believe that this group of people okay, called the Aryans may have originated in India. But there's really no archaeological evidence to support either theory. However, the Aryans did leave the Vedas behind which left a picture of Aryan life. And if you remember from your vocab, the Vedas and the Upanishads were both um, words that you had to define. Okay, so you should have a decent idea of what that is. So taking a look at India right here, okay, the Aryans that we're talking about crossed the Indus River Valley, okay, into this area, all right, and then this present-day India is primarily where most of the Hindus in the world are found. So the Aryans transformed India, okay? The Vedas were four collections of prayers, magical spells, and instructions for performing rituals. The most important being the Rig Veda, which contained 1,028 hymns to the Aryan gods. All right? There's no written form of the Vedas. It was passed down from elders from generation to generation, which is pretty remarkable considering okay, that people still know the Vedas. So we're talking some 4,000 years ago, all right? Here's just a little example of what they looked like. So the caste system develops. The Aryans had an enemy, all right, that went by the Dashas. The Aryans were taller and lighter skinned, spoke different language than the Dashas. The Aryans were not as developed as the Dashas. However, they did develop a system known as the caste system. So what was the caste system? Okay, the Aryans were organized into four groups. The Brahmins, okay, meaning the priests, the warriors, okay, or the soldiers, the traders and landowners and peasants and traders. As the Aryans settled in India, they developed close contacts with non-Aryans. They were put into a new group in the caste, the Shudras, the laborers who did the jobs the Aryans didn't want to do. Okay, And the Varna's skin color also became a distinguishing factor of the caste system. Okay, So essentially what happened, we kind of explained it a little bit. These people were in charge, all right, the Brahmins. Then the warriors kind of did what the Brahmins told, but also lived a very comfortable life. The traders and landowners kind of own land, okay? They could make a little bit of money, all right? But the peasants and other traders, along with the shooters and varnas, had probably the hardest life, okay? Doing things that other people didn't want to do, um, things like cremating bodies, um, cleaning up after other people, okay? Things along those lines. So it's just kind of a how it's broken down on a human, okay? So the Brahmins they view as the head, the Kshatriyas as the arms, the Vishiras, okay, the legs, and the Shudras, the lowest, okay, being the feet. So the caste system evolves. As time went on, the caste system evolved. Classical texts state that this caste should not be determined by birth, all right? However, over time, some communities developed a system in which people were born into their caste, all right, meaning they were born into whatever level they were that their parents were, okay? So if their parents were at the lowest level, that's what caste they were born into, the caste membership determined the work they did, whom they could marry, and the people with whom they could eat. This level of the caste who were considered impure 
butchers, grave, di grave diggers, and collectors became known as the untouchables, literally meaning that you could not touch them. Okay, so people often would, you know, treat these lower level caste people super badly. All right. Aryan kingdoms arise. So over the next few centuries, the Aryans extended their settlements east. Progress was slow due to cleaning out the jungle for farming, but it grew easier with the introduction of iron. Over time, minor kings wanted power and struggles arose. They struggled over the land and power. Due to the violence and confusion of the time, people started to question the place of gods and humans. Out of this turmoil, new religions formed in the country of present-day India. So we're going to watch this short little video. Okay, this guy's name is John Green. Puts out pretty good stuff. Hi, my name is John Green. You're watching Crash Course World History, and today we're going to talk about India, which is hard because A, I only have 10 minutes. Mr. Green, Mr. Green, I don't have time for you today, me from the past. B, when we study history, we tend to study unified polities that we can label, like the Roman Empire, or China, or believers. And this emphasis on unity tends to C, lead to labels that mask a lot of historical difference, like for instance, Europe, which is such a weird and nebulous word that we don't even know what it means. Plus, D, no offense, Europe, but there are not many histories more complex than India. And, D, a lot of what we know about Indian history comes from British historians who both used and embodied the phrase historical bias. All of which, F, makes it very unfortunate that we only have ten minutes, but we will do our best. Okay, we're gonna make this like Voldemort's soul and split it up into eight parts. <laughs> Part one, the Vedas. So as you no doubt remember, the Indus River Valley was one of the earliest cradles of civilization. But that original civilization basically disappeared sometime after 1750 BCE. Then there was a long period of Aryan migration, and by Aryans we do not mean like prehistoric Nazis, we mean people from the Caucasus who migrated down to the Indo- Gag, 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 can, Stan, can you just spell it for me? We know about these Aryans primarily because they left behind religious texts, the earliest of which is called the Vedas. The Vedas are also the earliest texts of what will come to be known as Hinduism, although it wasn't known as Hinduism then. And they're responsible for tons of stuff, but we only have 10 minutes, so let's just cut to part two, the caste system. The caste system is one of India's most enduring and fascinating institutions. Let us read from one of the Vedas about Purusha, the universe pervading spirit. When they divided Purusha, in how many different portions did they arrange him? What became of his mouth? What of his two arms? What were his two thighs and his two feet called? His mouth became the Brahman, his two arms were made into the Kshatriya, his two thighs the Vaisyas, from his two feet the Shudra was born. So this section gives a divine explanation for the caste system. Brahmins, who as Purusha's mouth speak to the gods, were at the top. Kshatriyas from Purusha's arm became the warriors, as you no doubt know if you've ever attended my gun show. Vaisyas, the merchants and artisans who provide money for the priests and the warriors, came from Purusha's thighs, because everybody knows the thighs are the money makers, and the shudras are at the bottom. They're the feet, the laborers and the farmers who are the foundation of the social order. Also, the rest of us stand on them. The caste system becomes much more complicated than this, but that basic division into four classes remains throughout much of Indian history. In spite of the efforts of many reformers we'll be meeting in future episodes of Crash Course, the caste system is the foundation for another big concept in Hinduism, part three. Dharma. Dharma is basically one's role in life and society, and it is defined primarily by birth and by caste. The whole idea is explained nicely in this passage from the Bhagavad Gita, where Krishna is talking to the warrior Arjuna. Having regard to your own duty also, you ought not to falter, for there is nothing better for a kshatriya than a righteous battle. The Bhagavad Gita is a section of a much larger epic poem called the Mahabharata, which basically tells the complicated and long story of a war between two kingdoms. And we can really see how important Dharma is in this passage, because Krishna is basically telling Arjuna that because he is a warrior, a kshatriya, he must fight. Even if he's bad at it, like for instance, if he gets killed, it's still preferable to not living his Dharma. It's better to be a bad warrior, if you're a kshatriya, than to be the world's best baker. Basically, you're better off fulfilling your own Dharma poorly than doing someone else as well. That leads us to part four, samsara, moksha, and karma. There are both personal and social reasons for doing your Dharma, right? The social reason is obvious. Dharma and caste combine for excellent social cohesion. You get the exact right number of bakers and the exact right number of warriors. We could stand to implement this system in the United States, actually, where everyone 
everyone knows, we suffer from a shortage of electrical engineers and a surplus of people who want to be on reality TV shows. That would never happen in ancient India. But say that your dharma is to scoop animal dung your entire life. Why do you keep doing that when you see other lives that at least appear to be far more fulfilling? That leads us to the concept of samsara, or the cycle of rebirth, often called reincarnation. The basic idea is that when you die, your soul is transferred to another living thing as it is being born. And if you fulfill your dharma, things improve and you get reborn into a higher being. You don't have to scoop elephant dung anymore. But the ultimate goal is not to be reborn as a Brahmin. The ultimate goal is to be released from the merry-go-round altogether. And that release is called moksha. The law that holds all this together is karma, which is summarized really nicely in the Aranyaka Upanishad. The doer of good becomes good. The doer of evil becomes evil. One becomes virtuous by virtuous action. Bad by bad action. The Upanishads, by the way, are later religious texts that began as commentaries on the Vedas, but later became sacred writings in their own right. This is a really great way to organize a social order from top to bottom. Everyone has a role, and because their role has a religious dimension, society stays in balance. But as a religion, Hinduism has a problem, at least if you want to start an empire. Everyone's path to salvation is individual. The original Brahmins tried to set themselves up as political leaders, but Hinduism doesn't really place a premium on worshippers obeying their leaders. And if you are a leader trying to make your subjects listen, to you. That's kind of a bummer. Which brings us to part five, Buddhism. We can't just... All right, so that's going to bring us to Hinduism. All right, so there's about one billion Hindus around the world, okay, located primarily in India, Nepal, Pakistan, Malaysia, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka, and approximately 1.2 million in the United States, okay, which is a pretty decent amount. So what we're looking at here primarily, okay, this would be India, Nepal, okay, Thailand, this area over here, all right, this is the location in the world where most Hindus live. So Hinduism has a very diverse set of teachings, okay, they call their dharma, all right, ethics and duties a person should follow. So similar to what we would consider the Ten Commandments as a Christianity, the dharma is kind of that. For Hindus, samsara is the continuing cycle of birth, life, death, and rebirth. Okay, so that process of reincarnation, which he's talking about being reborn over and over again. Your karma is your action and reaction. So how you are as a Hindu in your prior life will be how your life will turn out in your next life of reincarnation. And then moksha. Okay, so eventually for Hindus, they believe that they can be liberated from the cycle of samsara or rebirth. And then they would achieve moksha which in Christianity would be similar to like going to heaven. Their Brahman is their supreme soul and their Atman is their spirit or soul of the individual. So some view the Brahman as a personality. Okay, Vishnu is considered the preserver. Brahma is considered the creator and Shiva considered the destroyer. All right? The above three represent the Hindu triad and Hindus often have a shrine dedicated to each deity. Deity meaning one of the gods. Okay. Hinduism has developed a system of symbolism and iconography okay, to represent the sacred in art, architecture, and literature. So here's some Hindu art. Okay, So this would kind of be the Brahman, okay, meaning Vishnu, Shiva, and Brahma. Here's some more. All right, there's hundreds of Hindu gods. So the Hindu triad or the Trimuti, okay, Vishnu. He is said to have helped the Noah figure in Hinduism survive the great floods. Remember, Vishnu considered the preserver. Brahma is often seen with four heads. He had five, but one was chopped off by a demon. His four heads are said to stand for the four Vedas. And then Shiva, the destroyer, has two main avatars off of his own body, one of them being Krishna. So remember, Hindus believe that they can be reincarnated as well as their gods can be reincarnated. So the Upanishads represent some important texts in Hinduism, written as a form of dialogue between teacher and student. The teacher tries to explain how the student can escape from desire and suffering in this life. So kind of unique how it's written. The Bible is more of a group of stories. OK, the Upanishads are literally a student asking questions. OK, and then the questions are answered by the teacher. So a little bit different narration. All right, so the belief in reincarnation, individual soul or spirit is reborn over and over until they achieve perfect understanding, which can take a very long time. All right, a soul's karma follows that individual, the caste one is born to, 
is influenced by this process. So if you were a bad Hindu in your past life, the caste that you are born into would probably be a lower one, like an untouchable. Okay, Reincarnation is not funny or trite in Hindu teaching. So the caste system in Hinduism, all right, the Aryans introduced the concept of the caste in Indian culture, which was a very rigid class system. Hinduism in some ways explained the caste in terms of reincarnation and process on the road to moksha. This led to a system that took centuries to eliminate Indian society, determined the work you could do, who you would marry, and who you could eat with. Another religious movement rejects the caste and emerges in India. Which brings us to Buddhism, which we'll be covering next time. Thanks for listening.